Hi everyone, this is Kate and I'd just like to give a little talk about the script is written and actually want to want to call this video Your Day is Not at Random. Which ties in with the script is written. So I'll try to give a little bit of an explanation. So sitting quietly this morning before I came onto the group, I was shown a couple of years ago sections of the course and how they tie together and I did a little video, but I just, I think it was like a day or two after I'd had, and it came in through the night, how these, how this would happen. This would happen, I was sort of shown sections of the course and the word was highlighted and it was like there was an understanding that was came present into my mind through that. And this morning I was reminded of that and how to link this up with a couple of sections of the course. So it, it's going to help us really solidify these teachings of the Course in Miracles by showing us what we need to do, how, how we can practice, have a practical application of something in our lives as we go about our day that can bring about a happy day every day. So a lot of people get um, mystified by this, this, the script is written and I know for myself, it took me a long time to really understand what this teaching was about. The reason why we find it so confusing to understand the script is written because we're thinking about it and trying to understand it from the linear based thought system, which is the ego. The ego mind thinks with time and space, linear time um, and space, as in there's, there's space between me and something else. And so when we say the script is written, I just want to first of all read from lesson 158, where it says the script is written, and he does point to it in many other places, but this is generally what people refer to when they say the script is written. So lesson 158, number four, <clears throat> time is a trick, a sleight of hand, a vast illusion in which figures come and go as if by magic. Yet there is a plan behind appearances that does not change. The script is written. When experience will come to end your doubting has been set. For we but see the journey from the point at which it ended, looking back on it, imagining we make it once again, reviewing mentally what has gone by. So this, what's happening here, we're in what we call a dream and an illusion, an, an illusion of a world, we find ourselves seemingly thinking we're here in a solid physical world. But if you study quantum physics or you have any interaction or looking at it, you'll see that scientists are coming to see now that everything is just potential. How the world, how the world comes into view. And what we find in the world is, I think I did a good talk about the virtual the world as a virtual reality. And so if you can imagine your, your making the world you see, and you're making up the meanings you put on the world. So the world was projected as a way to hide from God, thinking that we're guilty. And then we've even, we've forgotten we've done that. 
as well. And so all we're aware of is the meanings we put on things and we're not even aware of that. So we have to go back the way we came in. So we've forgotten all these aspects. We've forgotten that we're dreaming a dream. We think the dream is real. I'm just gonna pull this one down a little bit further so you don't get that. I want to block off the reflection into my glasses. <laughs> so what happens is where we find ourselves, like today, when we're joining in this group and looking at each other, we think that there's time. We think that this is 9.35 on a Sunday morning, joining together, and then in five minutes to time on the clock, that I'm further along in time. But every single thing, every single decision we make now, me, me pulling that blind down, was already made. It's every single thing, even the happy dream, is already done. I could not pull that blind down unless I had the thought to pull it down. I have to have the thought first. So we come to see that I can't do anything or say anything unless I have a thought first. The thought always comes first, always. The thought. So what's my script? What is the script? Let's look, just look at what we term the script, okay. So I want to bring in these couple of, just first, you know, maybe summarise what I just said, is that we, every single thing that this character called Kate will do or say or go, where the body will go, what words will come out of its mouth, what all the actions it will do, has to come from a thought. It's, it, it's all its decisions and responses of the body. The body can't decide to do anything. I mean, my hand doesn't decide to move. I have to have something from my past that's moving my hand. I've done that in the past, so I'm doing it again now. All my decisions and all my responses to everything here in this world comes from which guide I choose. And that guide is thoughts, only thoughts. So when, if I'm in an ego mind and I wake up in the morning with the ego, and the ego says, this is going to be a crap day today, another crap day. I immediately feel that hopelessness. I feel tired, depressed. So that's the script. The script of my life is that I can't help but feel tired and depressed because I believed that thought. That is an ego thought. So the script is like, when we say the script is written, that thought um, that came into my mind when I woke up in the morning that this is going to be a crap day, that has to be an ego thought because it's total, totally opposite to love. It's totally the opposite to God's mind of perfect happiness and love. So it has to be an ego thought. So like what you were saying before, Kevin, was that when it says in rules for decision, two must join, a two must decide, 
it's you and the ego or you and the Holy Spirit. There's no you and another person. It's always you. Two must decide, me and the Holy Spirit, me and the ego, or me and the Holy Spirit. There has to be two to decide what sort of day I'm going to have. I, there's no me. I don't have me as Kate doesn't have any of her own thoughts. I don't have any Kate thoughts. There, it's impossible for you to have a thought of your own. You don't have any thoughts of your own. You have ego thoughts or Holy Spirit thoughts. Therefore, your day is not at random. If I believe the ego thought when I wake up, this is going to be a crap day, I'm going to find that crap day. I'm going to find it because I believe it. I'm going to find in the world what is in my mind. I'm going to look for it unconsciously. So say I walk out into the kitchen and maybe I live with someone or maybe I've left dishes there from the night before. And I'm going to think, oh, great. Now I have to wash these dishes first thing in the morning. What a crap day. So I'm going to walk outside and I'm not going to see the beautiful sun shining. I'm not going to see the lovely birds twittering. I'm going to find something in that backyard when I walk. I'm going to find something that I label as crap. Yet yeah, this world's crap, I'm going to say. I'm going to find. So that is my script for that day. My script is that I am joining the ego mind and I find in the world, in the images that I see, I make a meaning, I make the meaning that it's crap. So I could have walked into the kitchen and just said, oh, I'll quickly run through these dishes, get them out of the way, have a really peaceful, happy mind. Just wake up and say, I'll run them through and then I'll get out in the backyard and sit down just have a joyful day, look at the birds and the trees. So I find evidence of what thought system I choose. That is why he says in, I just want to go to rules for decision now. If you're in the blue FIP version, it's on page 628, chapter 30, section 1, paragraph 15, your day is not at random. The script that I choose today is not at random. I'm scripted. That thought, this go, this is this, oh, another day, it's going to be crap today. That's a thought that then gets me to see, to find in the world what's in my mind. So really it's about um, what, what is really the crap day or what I think is, is another crap day is um, when I have that thought. It's really what, what is really happening is guilt. The guilt in the mind that's finding something that's not joyful and loving and open and perfect. So when I'm talking about these things, I'm hopefully getting you to identify with how it works. When he says that we put the meaning on things and we find in the world what's in our mind, I want you to really, that's why I've talked through a bit of an analogy of how you can see the images of the world. So what we're trying to do is first of all, because we've forgotten that we've projected this world and it's not real, it's a total illusion. It's like a virtual reality. What, what we've, we've forgotten all that. <clears throat> we've forgotten that we've, we've projected it and we're, we're in a total projection of a world. 
then every time we turn our head, everything comes together to give us a view of what's in our mind, separation, separate things. The whole thing is based on separation. So the first part of going back the way we came, Jesus asks us to look at, he says, nothing I see means anything. He's asking us to really look at everything we see. So when I walk in and I see the dishes, they don't mean anything. He's asking us to just, this is the first step of getting into the truth. These dishes don't mean anything. Um, so you're sitting in the backyard and rather than just enjoying it, you're looking at, uh, say the grass needs to be cut. And you're like, oh crap, I need to get my grass mowed. <laughs> so the grass being long doesn't mean anything. Grass is grass, dishes are dishes. They don't mean anything of themselves. He says, nothing I see means anything. Nothing I see means anything. We're looking at images that have absolutely no meaning. Nothing means anything. So these two teachings, lesson one and lesson two, are like fundamental teachings to bring your mind back to the first step of just this is sort of the underpinning of how to shift your awareness. So if I say nothing I see means anything, I can then see that I am giving everything the meaning it has. And therefore I can see that I'm joining. Then I, once I know that, that I'm giving everything the meaning it has, I can then get an idea. There'll be some further development of realization that there's a, there's a decision maker in my mind that is joining that meaning. So when he says, I have given it all, he's really, what he's trying to do, he's not going to say to you, you're the observer and you're joining the ego that is giving a meaning. That, that's, um, that's further down the track. You're going to get a further understanding that when you have to first become aware of the meaning you've put on it. So you say, okay, I've, I'm, oh, I've become aware that, yeah, I've got a choice in how I view these dishes sitting on the sink. I've got a choice of how I view it. So I'm giving it a meaning. If someone else can walk in the room and give it another meaning, it means that it doesn't mean that. If someone can have another meaning of something, it means that I've got a choice about the meaning I give it. It means there's choices. It doesn't mean that. I have to look and say, oh, I'm giving it that meaning. It doesn't necessarily, this is why it, what comes then, this is forgiveness, because you start to see, I've given it that meaning. I've always been giving the dishes on the sink that meaning. So then, so then the next step in that, is to see that the I that I think is giving that meaning is the ego, that's not me. So then he leads on to a few lessons later on that they're not my thoughts. Those thoughts that put a meaning on the dishes aren't my thoughts. They're the ego and I am not the ego. So when I walk into the kitchen He's asking us to get some distance between me as the observer and the thoughts that come into my mind that I'm choosing to join. So he's starting to say the you. You, there's the decision maker, have thoughts come into your, come into your mind. So if you walked into the kitchen and looked at the image of dishes on a sink and someone beside you was standing there and said, said to you, this is a crap day, look at these dishes on the sink, I now have to wash these dishes. 
you wouldn't say that's my thought you would say that's that's their thoughts and that's exactly what you need to say to the ego you need to say that's your version that's the ego putting meaning on the dishes on the sink that's the it that's the meaning that's the ego's meaning so he, now he's introducing a few lessons later that these aren't my thoughts this is the ego so the ego initially says this is going to be a crap day and then when you would get out of bed and walk into the kitchen it finds the evidence of it because you've already accepted the ego into your mind so it's going to find then you walk you, you do the dishes you walk out in the backyard and it's going to go oh crap i have to cut the lawn what a crap day so this is a really good analogy and i know because i lived it <laughs> so like penelope was saying you know you have to question everything you have to look at every single thought you have all through the day the thoughts you wake up with how those thoughts project start to see the meaning that it's putting on everything and the meaning is that it's crap it's terrible it's horrible it's always i'm unfairly treated by these dishes i'm unfairly treated by this grass so i'm unfairly treated by life the day i'm unfairly treated by my day so that's the ego the ego is based on unfair treatment it's it finds it everywhere it looks for it it looks at the image of some crockery sitting on a metal uh, shelf and so i wanted to re i want to re go through this slowly so you can really see it so you can follow in your own mind how this works so you can see so if i was to say to you um which script did you live today you can't help but live the script of the ego that day right you can't help it you are at the effect of every thought when you wake up the ego thought comes in and says it's a crap day when you get up and walk into the kitchen the ego says look at these dishes i don't want to do them this is terrible this is crap and it puts a meaning on what it sees and then it goes to the backyard that's the script how is the script written were they your thoughts did you say when you woke up in the morning did you say i want to find evidence today in everything i look at that tells me that life is crap did i do you wake up saying that today i'm going to find the evidence i'm going to look around at all the images i see and i'm going to choose an unhappy day i'm going to find the evidence of unhappiness no you didn't wake up saying that they're not your thoughts did you say when you walked into the kitchen i am going to choose the thoughts about these dishes did you choose them did you did you did you choose those thoughts did you actively we all want to be happy don't we so nobody wakes up in the morning and says i want thoughts that tell me how crappy life is all day long i hey and you don't sit up in bed and say hey bring on the crappy thoughts today okay and i have the thoughts that find um happiness unfairly treated uh, i want those thoughts today right you do you write do you sit down in the morning and write out all the thoughts you're going to have for the day do you say right these are going to be my thoughts today no when you walk in the kitchen the thought is offered to you you don't know what you're going to find you may not you may not even know that there's this you might have completely forgotten you do not know 
what thought is going to come into your mind next. Sit right now and try to think about the next thought you're going to have. It's not possible. It's not possible to know your next thought. It's, it's impossible to know any thoughts you're going to have throughout, throughout the day. You can't know what thoughts you're going to have. When you wake up in the morning, you can't know any of the thoughts that are going to come into your mind. Therefore, if you don't know what they're going to be, how can they be your thoughts? How can they be your thoughts if you don't know what they're going to be? This was presented to me years ago and that was what got me seeing they can't be my thoughts because if they were, I would know what they were going to be. I would know what my next thought would be if they were my thoughts. So I had a great realisation when I tried to think, when I tried to think what would my next thought be. They can't be my thoughts. So then I start to see that I am something that is being thought. Something is coming in with thoughts. A thought is presented to me like a waiter offering me some food. So like little food on tray, I'm offered, would you like this thought this morning? When I wake up, I'm offered that thought. And I choose whether I pick up that thought or let it go. It's not my thought. Jesus says, it's not your thought. It's an ego thought and it's based on a whole thought system. So imagine somebody writing a system, a thought system. Imagine somebody writing down, now I'm going to write this thought system and it's going to be based in separation. And I'm going to offer the mind of Kate all day long thoughts based in separation. I'm going to keep offering Kate's mind these thoughts. And will she accept them? Will she accept those thoughts or not? And those thoughts are going to talk about Kate. They're going to assume that they're about Kate. I'm going to hoodwink her that they're her thoughts and they're about her and they're not. I fall for it. I fall for this idea that because thoughts say, oh, this is terrible, look at these dishes. I'm always unfairly treated by these dishes or by whatever, whatever story I make up of unfair treatment. That's another thing you can do, Penelope, if you want to do inquiry, just, just say, where's the unfair treatment in this thought? You'll know, it's an ego thought. It's always got unfair treatment, suffering or death as part of its thought. Unfair treatment, suffering and death, always at its basis. Me, it, these thoughts talk about me as a body. It's a virus thought system. In this thought system, this ego thought system, you need to, the next step, which I'm talking about, the second step is getting some awareness that there's you and there's the ego thoughts. It's being offered to you. The thoughts are being offered to you. They're not your thoughts. It's like if someone, had, just imagine someone else saying that to you. And you say, hey, you're not me. Why are you pretending to be me? If someone, if you woke up, if someone was there in the bed with you and you wake up and says, it's going to be a crap day today, it, it's, you, you don't say, oh, yeah, that's, oh, I'm going to take on that you're talking about me. You really need to really get yourself separated from the ego notice it, really backtrack that you're looking at the ego, you're noticing it, you're not identified with it, with its thoughts, you're looking at it. <clears throat> so 
So one of the ways is to think about, can I know my next thought? Sit and think about, can I know my next thought? And if you can't, why would you think that they're your thoughts? If they were your thoughts, you would know what they'd be. And therefore you start to realise that you're the thing that's looking at the thoughts. You're the thing that is aware of them. And that's when you start to move. This, this part of the journey is when you move more and more into being the observer and the witness and the decision maker. Okay, so this is why your day is not at random. Okay, your day is not at random because the thoughts that came in are the ego thoughts and they're always about unfair treatment, you as a separate body, you as being attacked, the world of separation and all its versions. The whole ego thought system is a bubble of thoughts and it just keeps offering them to you all day long and all you can do is say yes or no. So this is how it ties in with rules for decision. Your day is not at random. Now I just want to, <clears throat> your day is not at random. It's impossible to have any day and say to yourself, I didn't expect that to happen. I didn't expect to find the dishes on the sink and be upset. Um, it's not at random because when you walk in and you see the images of those dishes, the thought comes in, this is unfair. That's not random. That's the ego. The only, the only two things that are happening is I'm either choosing the ego or choosing the Holy Spirit. Your day is not at random. It is set by what you choose to live it with. It is set by what you choose to live it with. The day is set by what you choose. You choose. To, so when the ego offers you, this is going to be a crap day, you, the decision maker, choose it. What do I choose? That's how my day is set. When I say, yes, it's going to be a crap day. Yeah, all my other days have been crap. So of course this is going to be a crap day. I'm choosing the ego. It is set by what you choose to live it with and how the friend whose counsel you have sought perceives your happiness. Right, now this is what we're getting to. The ego perceives my happiness as getting my way. Remember, um, we did the big talk about um, <clears throat> how the ego perceives happiness and it says, it, you know, we did that talk about rules for decision and it says that the ego wants to be right and it perceives its happiness by being right, okay? And that's why he says you're better off if you're wrong. <coughs> Excuse me. You will always ask advice before you can decide on anything. Okay, so what we've got to see with these little statements here is that this is Jesus, the Christ mind, telling us exactly what is happening, exactly what we're doing. I ask advice before I decide on anything. So... I'm deciding what meaning those dishes are. That's the decision and that's my responses. So you see in rules for decision, he says we're either deciding or responding. Nothing else happens during the day except decisions and responses. I decide to get out of bed. I walk in, I see an image of crockery on a metal sink or whatever it is and I respond, I decide how I respond. So I ask the advice of how to respond. I don't see myself saying, hey, ego, 
I want to feel unfairly treated. How can you, what meaning can you put on these dishes so I can have the experience of unfair treatment? But that's actually what I'm doing. I don't, I don't see myself as doing that, but that's really what's happening. I'm looking at an image and I'm saying, I feel unfairly treated by life. And what meaning can I give this to validate the unfair treatment? And the thought comes in, this is unfair, this is, you know, it's terrible, life is crap, now I've got to do this and I've got to do that, it's going to take, and all the other thought, ego thoughts come in to give me a whole mindset of unfair treatment. So I ask the advice, I cannot get upset with those dishes on the sink unless I ask the ego, unless I listen to the ego. It's impossible for me to be upset unless the ego puts a meaning on it and I join that meaning. Okay, you couldn't. You couldn't get upset if you didn't listen to the thoughts that put a meaning on it. Otherwise, they're just images. You would just see image. There's no meaning on it. They'd be just images. You're just looking. Oh, there's an image. This has no meaning. It literally, there's no meaning at all on anything here. I have to see, I have to slow it all down. I have to go really, really slowly and notice, oh yes, that thought came in and yes, it put a meaning on it. You always ask advice before you can decide on anything and decide on my responses or decide on what to do. I always ask advice. I have to really slow this down and say, okay, when I walked in the kitchen, I had that thought. But what I'm unaware is it's not my thought. I say, I, the ego said that those dishes shouldn't be there. I shouldn't be unfairly treated. Life's not fair. That's what the ego gave me. And then I joined it because I wanted to feel unfairly treated. I wanted to feel it's all this, I'm guilty, I'm bad. It's hopeless. God doesn't love me. No one's here for me. I'm unloved. I'm fearful. I'm tiny. I'm small. I'm unsafe. It's this whole thought system of being separate from God and all its thoughts. And it just finds the evidence in the images that it sees. Now, Jesus says, let this be understood. And you can see there cannot be coercion here for grounds for opposition that you may be free. So in other words, um, what he's saying here, that what I've just talked about and explained in the way that I've understood through the understanding coming through in my mind of how this works and being aware of it myself and going through this, going back home, is I had to see that I originally was fully in the ego and I had to see the meaning I put on it. Then I see that it wasn't my meaning, it was the ego's meaning. And then I had to move into this awareness that I was the one looking at the ego and choosing it. So it comes over time as you keep looking and investigating your mind and thinking about looking at all your beliefs, looking at how you're finding the unfair treatment everywhere, the meaning you're putting on things. Look at things and just say they're just images. He says in lesson one, nothing I see means anything. Just look around. It has no meaning. And if it does, the ego is putting a meaning on it. It's not mine. It's the ego. And that's why everyone puts different meanings on everything because the ego does that. It puts different meanings on everything. So this sentence here, he's saying, let this be understood and you can see there cannot be coercion here. So he's saying here that what he's telling us about about how we're deciding with the ego. Um, he doesn't want us to, to coerce us. He doesn't want to say, he wants us to look. He doesn't want us to just read these words or listen to what I'm saying. He wants us to look at it. He, he, he says, if you want to really understand this, look at your own, look from your own perspective. Look within your mind. And do this, do this looking, do this investigation, do this inquiry yourself. 
um, nor grounds for opposition that you may be free. There is no freedom from what must occur. And if you think there is, you must be wrong. So in other words, what he's pointing to here is that he's telling us, pointing to that we believe that we're the thoughts we think and that we, that there's no, when we're caught up in those thoughts, we have no awareness that there's a decision maker or a witness to the thoughts. We think that every thought, ego thought that comes into our mind is our thought, is me, it's talking about me, it's talking about the dishes I see. It's, we, that's why it takes a lot of quietness and a lot of looking and a lot of inquiry to get back into the mind and look at the thoughts and start to see this. Um, and he that says for opposition that you may be free. In other words, the ego is going to say, <coughs> or the thoughts are going to say, the ego thoughts are going to say that of course they're your thoughts. They're talking about you and that you're free to think your own thoughts. The ego says that you have your own thoughts and that you're free and that you'll have free will. And Jesus is saying there's absolutely no free will. The whole script is written. Your day is not at random. When you get up in the morning, the ego is going to find the unfair treatment in all the images it sees, wherever it goes. The whole script, wherever you go, you go in your backyard, you go in your kitchen, you go in your lounge room, you meet your partner, you go to work, you get on a Zoom, you're going to find the unfair treatment everywhere you go. The script is that you're going to suffer throughout the day. You're going to, be, you're going to be, feel guilty and you're going to find guilt in everyone. That's the script. The whole script is written. It all comes from the mind. There's nothing. If the, all the images mean nothing, they're just shadows, light and dark moving around. And we've, we've seen a shadow, we've seen an image of a tree and said, oh, we call that tree, we put a label on it. And then we say tree is good or tree is bad. It doesn't mean anything, it has absolutely no meaning. Nothing means anything here. You could make up a virtual reality world of anything and then put meaning on it. And that's what we're living in. A virtual reality meaning that we've given, our mind's given it. The virtual reality is being made by the mind on some level that's projecting this and we're seeing it. There is no freedom from what must occur. So when he says there is no freedom from what must occur, he means that throughout the whole day that I go through, there's no freedom for me. I have to experience all the emotions that come from the thoughts that are offered me, that are offered into my mind. So when I'm in the ego, I have to, I've got no freedom. There's no Kate's thoughts. There's no Kevin's thoughts or Penelope's thoughts. It's impossible. It's just ego thoughts. It's a thought system we're all listening to. Everyone's listening to the same thought system. There's no, there's no depression, there's no psychiatric this and that. It's just ego. It's all ego thought system. There's nothing but the ego thought system that we're listening to. And the ego categorises the ego thoughts. And it categorises. So people that listen more and more to the ego thoughts, they're categorised as... Um, psychotic or blah, 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 I'm hearing voices. Yeah, it's ego's voice. Every mental illness is ego. That's all ego. There's no, there's no private thoughts. We're all having the same thoughts. Everyone I've ever met that has talked to me when I do groups and one-on-ones, every thought they've had, I've had. 
We're all listening to the same thought system. It's the one ego. It is listening, it's broadcasting all day. And it pretends to be you. It's thoughts that seem to be about you. So you listen to it. If you can get just that little inkling that you're not that thought and that you're listening to it, you're one step. That's the second step into looking at the thought. So I remember I was listening to Eckhart Tolle's talk just a few days ago when, and I'm reminded that he had that realisation when he said, I can't stand myself. He straight away, his mind went, oh, there's a me that can't stand myself. So he, in his mind, he, he might have had that thought, I can't stand myself over and over and over again for years but there was a seeing of it in that moment there was a realization he got some illumination in his mind that there's me looking at myself i can't stand myself i can't stand these ego thoughts i'm i'm can't stand these ego thoughts which which presume to be myself every thought so imagine the thoughts feeding into your mind they're getting your thoughts they're offering your thoughts all day and they tell a story they put a meaning on everything that's all those thoughts do put a meaning on everything put a meaning on you put a meaning on this world put a meaning this world means nothing it has no meaning at all every bit of meaning has to come from the ego so there is no freedom from what must occur. And if you think there is, you must be wrong. So there's Jesus. If you think there is, if you think that you have freedom of how your day is, you are wrong. You must be wrong. So he's just being really, really candid here. He's really trying to get us to see this. He wants us to be free. He dearly does. He wants us to be free of the ego. He wants us to be free of suffering. He's giving us a way out. So we have to just take the time to look at this and, and really comprehend, even if you can't get a seeing of this, even if you can't, it feels like gobbledygook, whatever I'm saying, it means it seems clear as day to me when I say it, but I know when I first read this, didn't understand it many years ago. So this is why all the lessons work together. It's really starting to, um, that's why practicing the lessons is really good and contemplating it and sinking below the thoughts. We're really trying to get into the mind. We're trying to get it below the ego's thoughts so that we can get to that decision maker mind, the part of the mind that's going to start choosing the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the second rule as well is but a fact. Okay, so the, he's already said the fact is that your day is not at random. So if you think, oh, my day, when I wake up in the morning, oh, I'm, you know, everything that happens to me happened randomly, and, you know, no, you're choosing the ego, but you don't know you are. So it's not like we're guilty for choosing the ego. We just don't know we're doing it. That's all. This is trying to get us to see that um, we have a choice. We can choose again. The second rule, for you and your advisor must agree on what must what you want before it can occur. So for you and your advisor, in other words, the ego or the Holy Spirit must agree on what you want before it can occur. It is but this agreement that permits all things to happen. Nothing can be caused without some form of union be it a dream of judgment or the voice for God. Decisions cause results because they are not made in isolation. They are made by you and your advisor for yourself and for the world as well. The day you want, you offer to the world for it will be what you have asked for and will reinforce the rule of your advisor in the world whose kingdom is the world for you today what kind of day will you decide to have so say you let's just revise say you wake up in the morning 
and you, the ego offers you a thought, this is going to be a crap day, you just say, no thanks, not interested in that. Holy Spirit, you decide for me. Holy Spirit, I give you it this day. Um, be you in charge. I make no decisions by myself, which is by with the ego. So we know that the ego is the default setting. So it's like the default. So imagine if anything like on your computer is a default, it's going to come in. So say you've got a printer that's a default and you want to use another printer. The ego is the default printer. It's going to come up every time you want to print something. So anytime you want to do something, the default's going to come in. The ego's going to come in. So you have to actively choose the other printer. You have to choose the Holy Spirit. So you say, oh, yeah, the default's coming in. The ego default's coming in and putting a meaning on this. Okay, I've got to say, no, I don't want the default. I'm going to choose the Holy Spirit. So if you can know that you have only two choices here this is a really key aspect my the script of my day is not at random it's by which one i choose that's my script and i am responsible for that i'm responsible you read through responsibility for sight and i'm just going to quickly go there because this ties in really beautifully with these two aspects the script is written and your day is not at random I am responsible for what I see. When I walk into the kitchen, what I see, I see with my eyes, dishes. But what he's saying here about this word see is what I perceive, the meaning I give it. I am responsible because I can choose against it. So I'm responsible for joining the thoughts of the ego and seeing the meaning the ego puts on the images that the eyes see. I choose the feeling I experience because I've chosen that perception. When I choose the ego, I'm choosing the feelings that go along with that. I decide upon the goal I would achieve. So in the morning, when I wake up, I'm already deciding the goal. I've chosen this is going to be a crap day. I've chosen that. I've said, yes, yeah, it's terrible. Yep, yeah, this world's crap. Everything's crap. Look at these people. They're guilty. They don't love me. God doesn't love me. I'm choosing my thoughts. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. So when I walk into the kitchen and I think my day's at random and I've randomly come across these dishes and I feel unfairly treated by the fact that I have to do maybe a whole lot of dishes that from the night before, um, I am, uh, the happening, what happens to me is not the dishes. That doesn't happen to me. It's the meaning I put on doing the dishes. That's what happens to me. I experience the feelings that go, that come from the meaning I put on it. And the meaning I put on it is not my meaning, it's the ego. So say, for example, I'm going to give another example here. I wake up in the morning. And for me, I don't have the ego giving any meaning to anything. So thank God for that. <laughs> I wake up in happiness and joy these days. But for a long time, you're going to experience, you're going to have the ego and the Holy Spirit. And you're going to be wavering. So you're going to start to see that you can choose. You can choose between them, okay? So, um, so there's going to be quite a long period of time, depending on how... Um, committed uh, you are in doing this work, how long it takes um, and how willing you are to question everything you, or, you know, question the ego's thoughts that come in and have the Holy Spirit correct them. So when you wake up in the morning, say the ego offers you the thought, this is going to be a crap day and you're practicing A Course in Miracles, you would notice it. Ha ha, the ego's coming in. The ego's offered me that thought. Holy Spirit, you be in charge. I'm going to do rules for decision. Holy Spirit, you be in charge. You are the love, the beauty, the love and the gorgeousness of God. You choose for me. And then I'm going to think about the happy day. I'm going to think about being happy, loving everyone, 
having a happy day, going around, blessing, loving, joyful, the experiences I want to have. I have experiences of happiness and joy, joining with people, communicating clearly. And so I get out of bed, I walk into the kitchen and I go, oh, it's the dishes there. I'll just quickly do those. And I just do them and I'm happy and I'm thinking about happiness. I'm saying, oh, okay, get these done. And then walk out into the garden and say, oh, the grass needs cutting. Okay, I might do that later. And sit down and enjoy the day, look out. It's beautiful. Look at everything, God in everything. <laughs> And that's your day. That's the, that's the choice, the happy day or the day with the ego. There's only two. You can't have any other day except the day with the ego, the day with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's, it's not a random. You know, they're not your thoughts, right? You can't choose them, you know. But you can choose to say, Holy Spirit, you be in charge. And then his thoughts come in. He's going to come in and help you. You're empty. You're an empty vessel. You have no thoughts of your own. There's not one thought that is associated with you as a son of God. You either offered the ego's thoughts or the Holy Spirit's thoughts. And that's why we say, let's step back and let him lead the way. Because we say, Holy Spirit, you choose for me. So you start to see, you can choose your thoughts. You can say no to those ego. You, they're not your thoughts, but they're offered in. And the less you pay attention to those ego thoughts, um, the less attention you give to them, they just die off. It's like they wilt. <laughs> I always think of the ego as like a big uh, balloon of hot air. And as you pay less attention to it, it's like, it just, it just goes down, it shrivels up. It's just this empty, it's emptiness, it's nothing. But you believe it is. So this is the journey for us. This is the journey, uh, this is our day. Oh, what will I give my attention to today? So I didn't want to make this too long because I, I, I'm just feeling like I want to go over and over those, but I think I've gone over and over them enough. <laughs> so let me go uh, back to that lesson about time. So time is a sleight of hand. So what, what he's really talking to is that... Um, that this, this world is made up seemingly of time and space. But if you couldn't remember the past, you have no time. If you don't think of the future and you're, and you're right, and that's how an awakened or a clear mind um, without any thoughts uh, is just present. It is present and the Holy Spirit just comes in and says, do this or say this or whatever you're sort of seemingly living in time but you're 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 like seemingly sort of in time because it looks like you're in time uh, this is how my mind experiences um but i'm actually in timelessness i don't i don't so i'm living in like <laughs> using time but my mind has no time it's in timelessness it's seen the tiny mad idea it's seen the whole thing it's seen the whole ego thought system but to start with, I just had to notice thoughts. I just had to do the steps like everyone else. But if you practice this, you'll come to a clear mind and empty of the ego, empty of the ego's thoughts. You'll wake up, you won't have any ego thoughts. There'll be nothing that says this day's going to be crap. You'll, you'll just wake up and you will just feel, you'll just have this experience of this glorious, beautiful love joined with the Father. And there's just going to be a song that you're in. <laughs> and it's just going to see everything as love. And just so heaven's reflected. It, but it's, it, this look, it's just so hard to put into words because words don't do it. But it's the experience. So the experience is oneness and love and heaven. But it's still seeing images, but it's just not taken in. It knows that the images, it's just a big projection, a big, a big play. It's just a um, uh, virtual reality game. It means nothing. Who we are aren't even here. There's no virtual reality game, but here we seem to be. 
and we're dreaming all this. We, we've made up this illusion. We've created as part of the mind. And when you awaken, you see all that. You understand all that. You see it. Like it's, I don't know how to use words to say you see it. You know it. You, 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 you get the Holy Spirit's mind. It's your mind. That's that mind that's correcting you is the mind you go and live in and it moves over to oneness. So there's sort of like the wrong mind, the right mind, and then the one mind, the mind of God. You're seeing it, even though your mind, your eyes are still seeing images, your mind knows the truth. You're living in a mind that no one, that you, virtually everyone you talk to has got no experience of. So you see, I see everyone speaking from the ego, totally asleep in the dream of separation because they're listening to the ego all the way long. And I do too. But now I live in a mind that is living in timelessness. It's just so present. It just, it, do, it can't think about the future. It just doesn't. It doesn't come in. Thoughts of the future or concerns or worries about anything just don't come in. They've just gone. Thoughts about the past just don't come in. I mean, the thought, the stuff about the past will be used as a teaching. That's it. And it's like it'll, whatever happened to what so-called Kate it was just a story of a mind asleep in a dream. Nothing more, nothing less. God's mind has got nothing. It has no, there's no world, there's no separation, there's nothing. And it is part of the, there is that part of our mind is still there in all our minds. It's one mind. I know people are going to sort of come on and say what I'm saying, but trying to point to it and using words. And it's really hard to point to an experience because you have to have the experience. So if someone's not experiencing, they're trying to guess what experience, what the experience is like. And I did that too. But when you get to this experience, it's very different to what you think it's going to be. That's one thing that I've heard from the people that I've worked with that have awakened. They've said it's very different. I said, yes, that was my experience too. It's very different to what you imagine. As you're going through the course, you imagine what it's going to be like and it's not like that. And no one can tell you. So uh, is there any questions? Yeah, Kate, that's um, it's interesting that because on my little blurb when I wrote that you were coming on today that we might get stuck on the rules for decision first, but it's exactly the same thing, isn't it? That's what you're talking about. Uh, look, it's really good. We, we, I know that myself and I think probably some of the others, we understand the ego stuff really well. <laughs> and I live in the ego. I understand that really well. And it's a part that you can't explain that I have trouble with because... I think I get a bit of an inkling. Alison said something about doing house. We talk about housework sometimes. Alison brought up the thing about doing housework, the different experience she had one day of doing housework. And I think that's what you're alluding to. So when you walk into the kitchen and see the dishes without the ego, what do you, you walk into the kitchen and you see the dishes, but they're just, what, what's to you it's like? It's like anything else. That's, it has no meaning. And you either do them or don't do them and there's no yeah. thought around anything. Yeah. There's no, there's no, that's it. And actually um, what happens is the Holy Spirit's in charge of my life, but it is the mind in which I live. I have my being in it. It's, it's just a beautiful mind and it just decides everything. It just says do them, don't do them, go out here, make a cup of coffee, ring this person, say this, do this, walk the dog now. Um, it just it just leads me. It's like there's no plan for anything, any time, ever, anywhere. I just there's no plans at all. Okay, so going back to rules for decision, I'm walking out into the kitchen and I see the dishes. I think, oh, the dishes. How do I decide, and what does that look like when I decide with the Holy Spirit? I have to. Uh, what's the process that I do that to? Okay, so what happens is when you say, oh, the dishes, you can notice straight away. Oh, um. I've got upset. So how you can really notice is when you're upset, when you feel yourself frustrated, irritated. <clears throat> it's actually a murderous rage, and the murderous rage is towards God, right? It, it looks like it's the dishes, but it's not. 
is projected onto an image, on any the image, the dishes, bodies, anything. The images are here are just they're just images and we're projecting everything. So so her, the first step is to notice, oh, I'm upset, so I, I've chosen the ego. So what I used to do, this was my process, was I would just say, Holy Spirit, I give you my upset. I hand it over. So I, I not try to deny the experience of feeling irritated or frustrated. I'd say, Holy Spirit, have these feelings of frustration and irritation of, and all the thoughts that go with them. You have them. Help me see this differently. And I'd stand there. So this is something that I would have done throughout my transition period, purifying period. I would look at the dishes and I would just wait. And what would come through is they have no meaning. I look at them. They're bits of dust put together into shapes. They've got a bit of food left on them. What's it mean? There's no meaning. Why, why, and also like you standing there doing dishes, what's that mean? Whether you're sitting in a chair, sitting in your garden, standing at the sink, what does that mean? It has no meaning. One's not better than another. That has to be a mego meaning. The one is better than the other. So when I'm standing doing my dishes, I'm, I'm just enjoying it. But there's no saying it's good or bad. I'm just happy whatever I'm doing, whether I'm cooking, whether I'm doing dishes, whether I'm vacuuming, whether I'm walking. It's always peaceful and happiness because God's peace goes with me wherever I go, no matter what I'm doing, because there's no meaning. There's no suffering. There's no a, a meaning put on anything. One thing I noticed in my, because what we have to do, we have to be like a scientist on our mind. We have to notice, we have to watch our mind. We have to notice what thoughts are coming in because we can't offer them up to the Holy Spirit unless we've caught them. So, um, it's Kevin back again. <laughs> um, so one thing I noticed years ago was that I, I would get annoyed by having to do things like the dishes and then I would go out, sit, sit outside and I'd say, I just want to get outside and sit in the sun or sit under the tree. And as soon as I sat there, the ego would say, you shouldn't be sitting under the tree. You should be out doing it. You should be back in the house doing this. And then when I got back in the house and did something, it would say, you should be sitting outside under the tree. And I started to notice that the ego would always tell me I should be doing something that I wasn't currently doing at that time. Whereas when you're in the Holy Spirit mind or the clear mind that has, just doesn't have any meaning on anything and isn't listening to the ego, it's just doing what it's doing. It's sitting under the tree or coming in, doing some housework or doing whatever it's doing. It's, it's freedom because it just doesn't see one's better than another. It just does those things. I mean, things have to be done. You know, it's like chop wood, carry water. There's going to be dishes to be done and some vacuuming and some dusting and some cleaning and some gardening and mowing the lawns. They'll just get done. Oh, well, what I do is I just say, Holy Spirit, you decide for me. If I need to do something, just bring it in and then I just let go. And as I move around, if I look at, say I looked at those dishes and I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling to do them, I just move, move along. Or I look at them, I might look at them and I just get go do them. Okay. There's no meaning. There's not, oh, it's suffering to do them or I love to do them or there's no right, there's no thoughts about it. It just, the mind is just definitely at peace, no matter what it's doing. Okay, so when we have other things, let's say we're doing something we like. Um, like some people like to watch Netflix and it's like a way of zoning out or something, but even then it's the ego in there, isn't it? Because the ego is telling us we shouldn't be watching Netflix, we should be doing our housework or we should be doing something well, that's, else. That's what I mean. It's like the, the ego will never let you rest. It never lets you rest, right? If you're watching Netflix, it'll be telling you, you you're wasting time, you shouldn't be doing it, there's other things to do, and you go and do those things and it says this is really boring, this is really suffering, 
you should be going and watching Netflix. So that's why you have to notice the nature of the ego. You have to notice it. You have to look at it and say, it, this ego is like a tyrant. It never lets me rest. I, can't, I never have any peace, no matter what the body's doing, where the body goes, what, the, what it's looking at, what its hands do. Now, all doing dishes is, is standing, moving the hands. There's nothing else. The body's moving. You, you, you could be out salsa dancing and the body's moving and doing, moving its hands. It doesn't matter. We, we put labels on these things and the ego comes in and says, this is good or this is bad. And if you notice that sometimes you'll love doing the dishes and sometimes you'll hate it, sometimes you'll love watching Netflix and sometimes you'll hate it. So it's, 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 the thing is, it's not good or bad. Nothing has any meaning here. And, and so when you move into the mind where you give up, you just say, look, all you have to do is say, Holy Spirit, be in charge. If I, wherever I need to go, just tell me. And then you'll, you'll basically get, it's that Holy Spirit has got a GPS for you. He's going to just tell you. It's going to... Um, this is going to guide you effortlessly. That's wonderful. The Holy Spirit never gets you to do anything you don't want to do. In terms of there's no you to not want to do anything. So that's that's the funny thing because when I used to think about Holy Spirit God and so be like, oh, what if it tells me to sell my house and go live in the bush or something? That doesn't happen because all the Spirit is really doing is getting you to share God's love. That's all the Holy Spirit's going to do is just, is just going to move you around as uh, teaching God's love. That's it. And, and it's not even like you're teaching it. It's that your mind's healed and it naturally loves. So the miracle is just a natural expression of Christ's love. And there's no, you don't feel yourself to be Kate or Kevin or Penelope. You don't feel yourself to be a separate. You don't, that's all dissolved, that idea that you're separate and that you've got a personality and because you've seen like what, what we've just been through, it's all been seen through. So how the, how it ends, how the ego ends um, you're just left in this mind of just pure love, pure peace, pure happiness. But until that's why we need to get into that habit of putting the Holy Spirit in charge and thinking about the happy day. We have to do that. It really sets the day up because that's, that's what we've got to see. So is it like some of those times when perhaps you're so involved in doing something you think you wonder where the time's gone because you're sort of thinking it's like you haven't had any thoughts about you just been in, in so involved or engrossed what you're doing or with my yeah. case going to the movies like when i go see a movie sometimes i can maybe be there and watch maybe even an hour of it before i have a thought i'm so taken with the movie just there not having thoughts about good or bad just just being with the movie that it's um the time just goes you know not so it's something like that, but different for you because you've got something else on top of that somewhere. Or yeah, it's, it's, I think a lot of people can identify a little bit. It's a little bit like flow. Say you're caught up in, um, it could be when you're caught up in a movie, excuse me, or doing, doing something like sometimes you might be in the car and you're just, you're just driving and there's no thoughts about anything or um, you're doing a craft, you can get caught up in craft or building something and you're just in the flow, there's no, this is good, this is bad, I'm, I'm terrible for taking so long doing this, what's my, you know, so that's just the ego, the ego is always, um, it's thoughts so that nothing's right, nothing's good, everything's, it's just a whole thought system that it just basically never brings peace. Um, so when you're sitting in the cinema watching a film, um, there could be some thoughts going on um, that you may not aware of. Um, 
but if you're feeling sort of really peaceful and flowy and just happy, then I think what you're saying, if that's been your experience, Kevin, then that's getting close to the experience of peace, the peace of God. Okay, now going back to the dishes. So what happens is I walk into the kitchen, I see the dishes, and I think, oh, I don't want to do this. And then I'll ask the Holy Spirit for help or ask to see it through his eyes or whatever. And then and for sure I'm going to have the next thought is that, you know, my partner left those dishes there. And I'm going to find my ego is going to find another way to, to get around it. Is that right? Is that your ego will no, come No, no, it won't. Once, you, once your heart, your really strong desire is to see this situation differently, I want to see this situation differently with all my being i want to have another view of it i want freedom from the current perception of this situation i'm in the ego i don't know what the different perception is i want another perception i desire it with all my heart because it will bring peace so there won't be any more ego thoughts i guarantee it there won't be another ego thought. You will go. You will move into because you've activated the Holy Spirit. Okay, so so what I'm getting at here is this, this came up the other day in a group. I think this is what it is. When we don't have that experience, we're still saying, "I want to be right rather than be happy." Is that right? Yeah. So if you if you're saying the words, "Oh, I heard Cade and I heard a few other people say, ask the Holy Spirit." And you think that's it. You're saying the words, but you're underlying still have this little part of your mind that says, no, this is just so unfair. Look what she left me. This is just terrible. If you've got that part of it, you won't get the freedom from it because you have to desire the different perception more than being right. So the ego is going to be saying, I'm right, I'm right about this, look at this, look at that, it's going to be coming in. And you have to say, oh, no, I want, so you have to rise your desire, so the ego's over here getting in the whole unfair treatment story about how bad everyone is and how you hate dishes and look at the food stuck there and it's all, it's got a big story and it's going to be, oh, I'm not going to have any fun times today because I'm stuck here and my life is always. So it goes to the past and it regurgitates all the times where you never had any fun and there's dishes and dishes and probably pictures, piles and piles of dishes to be done. So it makes a big story. So you have to actually really bring your desire for another perception above all that um, those dead thoughts, that dead story, that all that dead stuff coming in from the past. So it's like, okay, guys, let's bring the past in now into Kevin's mind. Let's push that in, you know, when two weeks ago when his wife left something on the sink and he was in charge of doing the dishes that day. Let's haul that thought in from the past. Let's throw an image into his mind that's not here now. Let's give him another image of him unfairly treated in this way. And, like, it's literally like the ego's like, come on, bring all those old dead thoughts and give them into Kevin's mind. And you have to, you're the one that can say, no. No, I'm not, I want another way. I give, so what I used to do is I just get the whole story. If I, sometimes I'd catch the first or second thought. Sometimes I had the whole past, Kate's past, all bought in. It's like the, it's the ego does, it goes past and... You can only see your past. You can only have a thought from the past. It's just like all the past comes up. Um, and it, it finds everything. It doesn't just find um, dishes. It finds, you know, everything. It, finds, it just trawls the dead past back into your mind. It, 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 ego never lets you experience the current happiness. It's just its story's always got to bring the past in. And so... Uh, and so for a period of time, you have to really have that strong desire, Kevin, to when you're there and the story's coming in, the air goes finding the dead past stuff to offer in to, to make you unhappy, right? It's going to bring you unhappiness, that story. It does. So that, that lesson, I want the peace of God above all else, 
has to be your such a strong desire in you that you will just say, no, I'm not interested in being right. In other words, I'm not interested in joining the ego that says it's right. Okay. Because these, the way he set up all these lessons and all this is he, he knows we're joined with the ego and we don't know we're joined with it. He, he knows that like the observer and the ego are joined together and we're unaware of that. So he, all those lessons and all those, the whole text and everything, is talking to us as if we are the ego because we that's where we're at. Our mind's joined to it. We've got no idea that we are choosing the ego. So he says, you'd be better if you were wrong. But what he really means is the observer is choosing the ego and you'd be better to observe. But, but what you do is you start to see that as you practice asking the Holy Spirit. So... This comes in in, an, in a more and more awareness as you do this practising, this forgiveness. Holy Spirit, help me see this differently. That's why the lessons of the course are um, really important to constantly um, apply those lessons, repeat them because they start to become your new thought system that the Holy Spirit then uses those thoughts of the course to look at it and says, it says, I have given all the meaning these dishes have for me. Right, so that's something that the Holy Spirit will bring into your mind. So I have given this. These dishes don't mean anything. So you'll just stand there and look at them and say, look at them, and you might get this real big realisation. Actually, this doesn't mean anything. Without the past, there's bits of, bits of crockery, bits of mud shaped into certain white shapes. I don't mean anything. There's nothing means anything. So you, you might get this just this seeing, as you say. So the most important thing is to desire the truth, desire the change, desire the correction to that ego thought above being right. Okay, that's that's the key to everything here. And the key is that I desire the correction above being right. I think what also I've noticed with myself and some of the others, and I hear Penelope say, I think pretty regular, we're all noticing our thoughts much quicker than before. Like we can, you can go on like, you can, hear, you can think about these things in a negative way for a long time without even noticing it. But these days, quite a few of us are noticing straight away, you know when you're in these negative thoughts and it's like, perhaps we're still not getting to the point where we're choosing to be happier over them rather than right, but noticing really fast, really quickly now. But I'm saying he can help you talk about it a fair bit too, I think. Yeah, for sure. And that is part of the journey. So you start to notice the thoughts, uh, you start to notice, and then you start to notice more and more your, as you notice them, you are noticing the thought. So the more you notice them, you start to realise there's a part of your mind that is noticing a thought. If you can look at a thought and say, I had that thought, you're not the thought. You're the thing that's aware of the thought. You start to say, actually, I'm the thing that's looking at that thought. I'm something that's aware of that thought. What is that? What is that part of my mind that is noticing a thought? See, most minds don't even no, they're not even aware of all the thoughts. So the more you can just look and then you can say, oh, look at that thought. That put that meaning on that. Oh, I used to have thoughts that put a lot of meaning on that particular thing or that item or that object or that service or that body. And then you start moving more and more into noticing the thoughts and when you're noticing, you're in some part and they call it awareness they put a label on that experience of the thing that you are that's noticing the thought so when you say can i know what my next thought will be you're in the awareness that is looking for the next thought and so therefore there is proof 
that you are not the thought. You're looking at it. You're noticing it. You're saying, look what that thought told me. Look what that thought said. So you have to be the thing that's looking at it. And as you start to notice more and more, you, you practice this, you will get more and more into the observer of the thoughts. You will get tangled up in those thoughts so many times, but you've already had, you're already getting to, and most people can't even get to that first part of noticing their thoughts. So you're further along the track, but there's much, much more to come. Okay, well, I'll leave that there and I'll let anyone else wants to ask some questions. Um, yeah, I just want to say, so when we say, uh, Holy Spirit, you decide for me, we're really asking for the Holy Spirit's thought to come through, aren't we? That's it. So that's the choosing of the Holy Spirit's thought or the ego's thought. We don't have to know, obviously, we don't know what the thought's going to be. So, we, But when we say you decide... I give it to you, you decide for me. We're asking for the Holy Spirit's thoughts. Is that right? That's it. So in other yeah. words, um, he's going to decide how to look upon everything and he's going to decide what to do and when to do it. Okay. So when that's why it's, he says the new habit is giving the, the day over to the Holy Spirit and thinking about the day you want. So though both of those processes work together to give you a happy day every day and you can get into the habit of having a happy day every day and moving towards that. So your day is not at random. It's whether I choose the Holy Spirit but, or the ego. But what he does say in Rules for Decision is that you can actually activate the happy day straight away by giving the day over to the Holy Spirit, which is the right-minded thoughts, okay, that are going to choose for you. So when you wake up in the morning, you say, you really mean it, say it, mean it, Holy Spirit, you be in charge. I put the love and wisdom, if you're not sure what the Holy Spirit is, it's just the love and the wisdom in your mind, the true mind that's going to look at everything and choose your responses. So, for example, you look at the dishes and you don't even have to say, Holy Spirit, tell me what to do. It, you've already put it in charge. And so Jesus says just by doing that, you've already activated um, the Holy Spirit to be making decisions for you. So you don't have to do it, you know, every 10 minutes. And he says it will help you not fall into putting the ego in charge of your day. There's something that's activated. When you, when you say to yourself, Holy Spirit, you be in charge, you, it, it, it's not just words. It, you can say these words to the cows come home. You have to mean it. You have to really say, I want the peace of God above all else. I really want this happiness. If, if Jesus says there's happiness to be had, and that I can have a tranquil and peaceful mind. I want to do this. So I'm going to practice this. I'm going to, and so I'm going to put the Holy Spirit in charge of my day. I'm going to think about the happy day I want. I'm going to just bring everyone into my hug, everyone into my heart. Everyone I meet, I'm going to bless. And even if I don't do it physically, of course you can't. It, it's just a mindset. It's a mind that blesses. And so it's already decided I'm um, seeing myself happy. So you might just see yourself happy. Where you're just happiness, just meeting people, happiness, laughing. You don't have to go into too many specifics. You could just see happiness. And what happens then is that the projection, the, the world that you see, is then the mind is happy, you've chosen happiness, and it's going to find it. So if you've woken up and the ego has, you've, it's told you something and you've joined it, then it goes out to find it in the world. 
that if you wake up and you choose happiness and you walk out and you see the dishes, it'd be like, yay, I'll happily do these dishes. I'll play around with some bubbly water. <laughs> um, and it's just happy to do anything. It doesn't, it doesn't categorise, the Holy Spirit mind doesn't categorise anything here as good or bad or something's better than something else. It just doesn't. It just doesn't have, that's all ego. It's the, the mind the, of living in the Holy Spirit mind is very, very different to living in the ego mind, the thought system of the ego. So our job, if we're still having the ego thoughts, our job is to undo. And not our job, our job is to ask for correction. And we've got the whole, all the lessons, uh, the, the um, lessons, he says those lessons go in to form our unified thought system. So, we, so the Holy Spirit is using those lessons to show us, it's gonna look at it. So, um, so when you're looking for correction, um, you know, all I could just say is that anytime you get upset, anytime, anywhere, anytime you're upset, you're, you've had an ego thought. And if you're willing to just say, look, I've mis misperceived something, I must be wrong in the way I'm thinking, I'm thinking with the ego, okay, Holy Spirit, you bring... I want another way. In other words, I want it. I really want this other way. I want, um, oh, oh, you know, when he says perhaps you are wrong in rules for decision, he he just means that, like, I guess where I got to is that I knew that the way I was perceiving everything was causing me a lot of unhappiness. And so I just became really, really ready to just say, look, look, the way I perceive everything must be wrong. So in that, I think I'd let, I let uh, that's why I think it was so quick how I got to awakening because I really just gave up and I just, I just sort of said, look, I have to be wrong about everything because I'm really unhappy, I'm depressed, I'm sick. I had a lot of pain, chronic fatigue, depression, anxiety. I was on a lot of medication for depression. And I just thought, if I want to be happy, I have to have all my perceptions changed about everything. And, you know, in that, you can just say, well, it's going to take as long as it takes. But having said that, in, in the script, is even that is in the script. Everything's in the script. Every single thing, every, the time you awaken is part of the script because it's all part of the same dream. The time you take to do your forgiveness is all part of the script. But the, because it has to be, because it, all the waking up of all, all the, the ego, the waking up of the mind, in truth, it never happened. So we're going through a whole awakening that we think is all real. We think we're all waking up, but we never actually fell asleep. So we're going through, it's like if you fell asleep at night and you came into a nightmare and someone's shaking your shoulder to wake you up, you know, and then you wake up, the shaking of the shoulder and the gentle whisper in your ear to wake you up, um, it was, was just part of, um, it was something that came in and, you know, if you woke up in the morning and you said to the person, say it was your mother that woke you up and, and you said, look, I had this really bad dream, that, that gentle whispering in your ear, you're asleep, wake up. It's not real. Whatever you're dreaming isn't real. And that is still, that is your, your experiencing that correction to the dream, the waking up from the dream while you're dreaming and that's part of the dream. But once you wake up, you go, oh, it was just a dream. It never happened. So you could say the whole script of that dream that you dreamt at night was in your mind 
and it was whatever you did was all in your mind doing and the and the time that the voice came in and tried to wake you up you know say you ignored that voice say that gentle voice and that you know you need to wake up you might turn away and no I want to you turn back into the dream and then five minutes later the child is so whether whether you do it at the first wake up or the second wake up it doesn't matter the thing is once you wake up you see that the dream wasn't real that's all nothing happens in a dream you're awakened that you you were dreaming that dream and it has it never went anywhere never did anything nothing ever happened to God and you it's God's love you never came into a body there's no world of bodies and form and it's all a big dream it'll all disappear go back to where it was and all minds awaken so my job is just to help everyone else see that help all minds awaken All right, so what's the time? I think we've talked for about two hours, two hours and 15 minutes. <laughs> Is Kevin still there? Mr. Kevin Vagona? Yep, uh, one hour and 45 minutes, I think it is. Oh, okay. Is it? That's yeah. right. Started at 9.30, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, look, I think we've, we've covered a lot today. It gives us a lot to think about. So um, I think we could just have our 10-minute meditation for everyone wants to stay. Um, but I think there's more to come, Kate. Okay, so I'm going to um, stop the recording now, my dears, my little lovies, my little friends. <laughs> we won. We win the one mind of God, <laughs> blessing and loving. So um, I'll stop the recording. We'll just do a little blessing to each other. We can just do it silently. Just look at each other. I say I love you and I bless you. You're beautiful. You're holy. I see just your holiness. <laughs> and I've already got a topic for next week, Kevin. If you want me to come on? <laughs> Good. Yep. <laughs> All right, darlings. I'll see you next week then. Are you going to give us a topic now so we can sort of think about it? Uh, yeah. The topic is um, basically how important is the Christ blessing. Okay, so, so I'll put that on the website next week too so that people know what's, which is like still going to be a mystery because it's a mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> Love you guys. Love you too. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Kate.